In this lecture, we shall discuss obtaining a judgment in default of appearance against a defendant in the High Court of Ghana. When we talk about default of appearance, what we are saying in essence is that the defendant that the action has been commenced against, that defendant has been served with the writ of summons. And even though the defendant is required to enter appearance within eight days after service of the writ of summons, that defendant has defaulted in entering appearance. Now, because he has defend, defaulted in entering appearance, the rules will permit us to apply to obtain judgment against that defendant by reason only of the default of appearance. So it's not a matter of the court even going into the merit of the case to take evidence. No. Once you have defaulted in entering appearance, because of that default, we can proceed and obtain judgment against you. So if you look at Order 9 Rule 5 of the CI 47, you remember that the time limit for entering appearance is eight days after the service of the writ of summons on you, unless that time has been extended by the court. And you remember we mentioned that if you have been served with the notice of the writ out of the jurisdiction, usually the order granting leave to serve out of the jurisdiction will specify the time for you to enter appearance. So if you do not enter appearance within the eight days, and then the plaintiff goes ahead to obtain judgment against you. That is the kind of judgment we refer to as a default judgment. Now, it is important to take note all of all of these because once judgment in default of appearance has been obtained against defendants, it becomes a judgment that can actually be enforced. It becomes a judgment that can actually be enforced. So the real question is that what would happen if a defendant defaults in entering appearance? Now, for you, if you default in entering appearance, I'll begin by reading the words of Amitete in his book, Civil Procedure, A Practical Approach, at page 326. And this is what he says, and I quote, the rules provide time frames for entering appearance and filing a statement of defense. Where a defendant defaults in either situation, the plaintiff may apply for judgment in default of appearance or in default of defense, as the case may be. The rationale for a default judgment is that the process of adjudication would not be efficient unless the timetable set out in the rules for the conduct of litigation is followed strictly by litigants. A defendant who defaults in entering appearance is thus deemed to admit the claim endorsed on the writs, and the court would enter judgment for the plaintiff where the rules so permits. Again, a defendant who defaults in entering appearance is thus deemed to admit the claim endorsed on the writs, and the court would enter judgment for the plaintiff where the rules so permits. Because the issue is quite simple. We have served you with the writ. Come to court and come and tell us that you are not liable. You refuse to enter appearance. It means that according to Kwamitete, you are deemed to have admitted what I have against you. So if I'm asking for 500,000 cities against you, you've admitted it. So I can go for that judgment in default of the appearance. Kwamitete continues at page 326 as follows. 326, and I quote, Whereas an application to enter a default judgment is based upon a strict enforcement of the timetable set out in the rules, an application to set aside such judgment is in essence a plea to the courts to extend time to comply with the timetable for entering appearance or for filing a defense. If the court declines the application to set aside a judgment, the judgment stands as an enforceable judicial pronouncement of the courts. It is erroneous to consider a default judgment as an interlocutor judgment because it was not entered after a trial. A default judgment may be interlocutory or final depending on the claim and the rule under which it was entered. A writ of summons contains a command to the defendant to enter appearance within a specified time, failing which judgments may be given for the claim. Disobedience of that command 
therefore entitles the plaintiff to apply for judgment in default of appearance where the rules will permit. What we are saying so far is that when you are served with the writ, it comes with a command that you must enter appearance within eight days. And that if you don't enter appearance within eight days, you can be deemed to have admitted and we can apply for judgment against you based on your default in entering appearance. As we have seen, the judgment can be a final one, it can be an interlocutory one, depending on what the rules say. But what you must know at this point in time is that when a defendant defaults in entering appearance, it can have serious ramifications. The plaintiff can apply to the court and obtain a judgment in default of the defendant's appearance so that the plaintiff would obtain damages, uh, uh, can obtain his reliefs that he's asking for. So you remember you mentioned that the judgments can be what? Interlocutory or it can be final. So the question is, when a defendant defaults in entering appearance, what types of judgments can the plaintiff apply for? Is it interlocutory? Is it final? What kind of judgments can he apply for? But now bear in mind, what you must know is that once the defendant defaults in entering appearance, the plaintiff can apply for judgment in default of appearance. That is what you must bear in mind at this particular point in time. The types of judgments a plaintiff can apply for if a defendant defaults in entering appearance. The first type we'll look at to be liquidated claims. In other words, if the claim you have against the defendant is for a liquidated claim, it's for 500,000 cities, 600,000 cities, it's for a fixed amount of money, what we can describe as a liquidated claim. The rules say that that one, if the defendant defaults in entering appearance, as plaintiff, you can apply for what you call final judgment against the defendant. This is what you get from order 10, rule 1, sub rule 1 of the CI 47, and it reads as follows. And I quote, where the plaintiff's claim against a defendant is for a liquidated demand only, and the defendant defaults in, fails in to file appearance, the plaintiff may, after the time limited for appearance, apply to enter final judgment against the defendant. For a sum not exceeding, that's claimed by the writ and for costs, and proceed with the action against other defendants, if in. I'm taking it again. Where the plaintiff's claim against the defendant is for a liquidated demand only, and the defendant fails to file appearance, the plaintiff may, after the time limited for appearance, apply to enter final judgment against the defendant for a sum not exceeding that's claimed by the writ and for costs and proceed with the action against the other defendants, if any. What this means is that if you as plaintiff, your claim against the defendant is for a liquidated demand, 500,000 cities, uh, amount from a loan, and he defaults in entering appearance, you can apply for final judgments and then take your costs and go against the other defendant. So assuming there are five defendants, first defendant defaults in entering appearance, you can get your default judgment against that person. After that, you continue against the other ones. Get final judgment. Now, if you look at that 10 rule 1 sub rule 2, it says that a claim shall not be prevented from being treated for the purposes of this rule as a claim for a liquidated demand. By reason only that part of the claim is for interests accruing after the date of the rate at an unspecified rate. But any such rate shall be calculated from the date of the rate to the date of entering judgment or final payment at the same rate as the prevailing commercial bank rate. In other words, telling you that the mere fact that I'm taking 50,000 Ghana CDs and I'm also taking interest on that amount at an unspecified rate, that will not make it an unliquidated claim. It will still be a liquidated demand. And we shall use the prevailing commercial bank rates to calculate the interest. Now, as far as liquidated claims are concerned, Kwame Tete, in his book, Civil Procedure, A Practical Approach, at page 326, has some interesting provisions that make it very clear for you to understand what liquidated claims are. Because we've already been told that liquidated claims, you get final judgment. But what exactly qualifies to be liquidated claims? Let's see what S. Kwame has to say about that. Liquidated claim. 
and I quote, and I'm reading from page 326 of his book. Default in entering appearance relieves the plaintiff of the duty to prove any liquidated demand endorsed on the rates and enables the plaintiff to apply for final judgment for the claim plus costs and proceed with the action against any other defendant not in default. Where the defendants are liable jointly and severally, judgment against one of them would not bar the continuation of the action against any other defendant not in default. Neither would it preclude a fresh action against the other person jointly and severally liable. Now, we are going to the explanation for what a liquidator demand is. And this is what he says. A liquidated claim or demand is a specific amount or debt claim. It is ascertained or ascertainable by arithmetic calculation. A specific monetary claim is not necessarily a liquidated claim. A claim of 1 million CDs damages for libel is a specific monetary claim, but it will not qualify to be a liquidated claim. Let me explain this and have your attention on the words of Pamit that have been highlighted in red. He's explaining what a liquidated demand is. He said that a liquidated claim for which you can get a final judgment is a specific amount or debt claim. You can ascertain that amount by arithmetic calculation. So, for example, if you've taken a loan from me and then you took it by 10,000 cities every month, so over the period it has become 120,000 cities. That is something we can ascertain by arithmetic calculation. If you are living in my house and you're supposed to pay rent of 10,000 cities for a month, 12 months will become 120,000 cities. This is something we can ascertain by arithmetic calculation. But if you are asking for 1 million cities damages for libel, you know now if I ask you, what did you calculate before arriving at the 1 million cities? You are saying that that's dumb. so that's something the court must the court must take evidence before they can arrive at that one million cities. In other words, the mere fact that somebody has mentioned one million cities in this statement of claim doesn't automatically mean that it will qualify to be a liquidated demand for which you can get a final judgment. So the explanation of a liquidated demand there is very crucial. He goes ahead to say as follows. That's Kwame in his book, Civil Procedure, A Practical Approach, at page 327. A sum of money described in an agreement between the parties as a genuine pre-estimate of the damage likely to be suffered upon breach of the contracts may qualify as liquidated demand, if claimed. This one is because we have both agreed that if you breach the contract, this is what they are going to pay. So this one is likely to qualify as a liquidated demand. A claim in quantum merit, i.e. reasonable remuneration for services rendered, has been held to be a liquidated demand, so as a claim for bank charges. A liquidated claim does not become unliquidated because it includes interest to accrue after the issue of the rate at an unspecified rate. In such a situation, the interest rate would be calculable from the date of the rate to the entry of judgment or, fi or final payment at the prevailing bank rate. Prevailing commercial bank rates. All you are saying over here is that under order 10 rule 1, you can get final judgment if your claim is a liquidated claim. But how do you know whether something is a liquidated claim or not? You must get your information from here. A liquidated claim is a specific amount or debt claimed. It is ascertained or ascertainable by arithmetic calculation. But we are being warned that a specific monetary claim is not necessarily a liquidated claim. And we're given an example, a claim for one million city damages for libel is a specific monetary claim, but it won't qualify to be a liquidated claim. Bear in mind, it is only liquidated claims that you can get a final judgment for when the defendant defaults an entering appearance. Now let's move on to unliquidated claim. But remember, under the term one, if it's a liquidated claim, you can get final judgments. What about unliquidated claims as provided for under order 10, Rule 2 of the CI 47? It reads as follows, and I quote, Where the plaintiff's claim against the defendant is for an unliquidated demand only, and the defendant fails to file appearance, 
the plaintiff may, after the time limited for appearance, apply to enter interlocutory judgment against that defendant for damages and proceed with the action against other defendants, if any. Where the plaintiff's claim against the defendant is for an unliquidated demand only, and the defendant fails to file appearance, the plaintiff may apply to enter interlocutory judgments against the defendant. For damages and proceed with the action against the defendant, the other defendants, if any. Now, other 10 rule 3, sub rule 2 reads as follows. Where the plaintiff enters interlocutory judgment for damages under rule 2, the court shall fix the date on which the damages or value shall be assessed and directs that notice of it shall be given to the defendant against whom the interlocutory judgment has been entered. A defendant, a defendant, who is served with such a notice is entitled to attend at the assessment and be heard on the issue of damages only. Now, let me explain what is happening. Your claim against a defendant is for an unliquidated claim, only for, let's say, damages, for example. So you're asking for damages for, for negligence, general damages for negligence. The court can't give you final damages. So the court will grant you interlocutory judgment before the defendant defaulted in the appearance. After giving the interlocutory judgment, the court will then adjourn. And then when it adjourns, it will adjourn and then ask you and give a date for damages to be assessed. So that it will adjourn. And then after granting the interlocutory judgment, the court will adjourn and ask the plaintiff to come and enter the box and bring evidence so that we can tell how much damage you have suffered. So in my rate of summons, I was asking for general damages for breach of contract. That is not a, an amount of money. It's not a liquidated claim. So the court will not grant me final. They rather grant me interlocutory judgments. Now, because we must ascertain the amount of damage I have suffered, then the court will adjourn and tell me that come to court on this day and come and bring evidence so that I can know how much money I will award to you by way of damages. So when I adjourn and you want to find out the amount that you are supposed to be given, we will ask you to enter the box so that you bring evidence on the, on the damage. Now when we adjourn and we are looking at how damages are supposed to be assessed, and you end up as a defendant now appearing before the courts, you can attend that means that hearing where they are going to assess the damages. But when you come, you cannot be heard on the merit of the case. You are going to be heard only on the issue of damages because we have already taken interlocutory judgments. So let me give a practical example. Let's say as plaintiff, I have sued a defendant and my principal relief or one of my reliefs is for damages for breach of contract or damages for negligence. In this damages for negligence, they can't give me final judgment. So as plaintiff, they'll give me interlocutory judgments and they will adjourn the case for the issue of damages to be assessed. If, as defendants, you now attend the court, because you've already obtained the interlocutory judgments, when you attend, the only issue we'll hear you on is on the issue of damages, so that we'll know whether the damage I'm claiming is enough or not. But on the merit of the case itself, that's one. You, you are not going to get anything. Now, order 10, rule 2 reads as follows. Where the plaintiff's claim against a defendant is for an unliquidated demand only, and the defendant fails to file appearance, the plaintiff may apply to enter interlocutory judgment. So bear in mind, if it's for a liquidated claim, you can get final judgment. But if it's unliquidated, you can only get interlocutory judgment. Now, let's see what the learned author Kwame in his book, Civil Procedure, A Practical Approach, at page 326, had to say about interlocutory demand. Interlocutory judgments for unliquidated claims. This is what he says at page 326 in my quotes. In a claim for an unliquidated claim, 
to which the defendant defaults in entering appearance, the plaintiff may apply to enter interlocutory judgments for damages and proceed with the action against any other defendant not in default, if any. Thus, in a running down action where the driver of the offending vehicle defaults in entering appearance, but the owner appears, the plaintiff may enter final judgment against the driver for special damages claimed and interlocutory judgment for general damages claimed and proceed further against the owner. The basis for the plaintiff proceeding against the owner is that judgment against the driver would not operate as res judicata against the owner because the owner and the driver are liable severally, not jointly. And judgment against one will not extinguish the liability of the other. So this is what Kwame has to say about unliquidated claim. That if it's an unliquidated claim, the plaintiff, what you're applying for, will be interlocutory judgment for damages. And you proceed against the others who are not in default. So if it's a running down action, and then the driver will offend, if you have a fact pattern, and it's a running down action. Somebody has knocked somebody down. If the driver of the vehicle defaults in entering appearance, but the owner enters appearance, so you have two different people, driver and the owner, as plaintiff, you may enter final judgment against the driver for special damages. Because that one, you are talking about a specific amounts which can be ascertained by arithmetic calculation. So you can get final judgment for that one. But the general damages, which has unliquidated, you only get unliquid, un interlocutory judgment for that one. Then you can proceed against the owner. So for the driver who defaulted in entry appearance, if you have special damages, you can get final judgment. But for damages, you can get interlocutory judgment. Then you cannot proceed against the owner. So the distinction between liquidated claim and unliquidated is that for liquidated, if the defendant defaults an entry appearance, you get final judgment. But for unliquidated, if the defendant defaults an entry appearance, you get interlocutory judgment. Next one we can look at is a claim in debt. If you look at the rules and our 10 rule 3, when the plaintiff's claim against a defendant is in debt, but the defendant defaults in entry appearance, what must the plaintiff do? The answer is in order 10 rule 3 of the CI 47. And this is what it says. And I quote, where the plaintiff's claim against a defendant relates to the detention of goods only, and the defendant fails to file appearance, the plaintiff may, after the time limited for appearance, apply to enter judgment against the defendant. A for the delivery of the of the for the delivery of the goods or their value to be assessed and costs. Or for the delivery of the goods and costs, or for the value of the goods to be assessed and costs, and proceed with the action against other defendants if any. You must certainly know what you have under the A, B, and C. You must know and understand what you have under the A, B, and C. If the claim of the defend of the plaintiff is indebting you, and the defendant defaults an entry appearance. You can apply for either the A, B, or the C. The A says that you can apply to enter judgment for the delivery of the goods or their value to be assessed and cost. That's A. Or you can apply for the delivery of the goods and cost. That's two. Or you can apply for the value of the goods to be assessed and cost. That's three. So these are the remedies you can get if your claim is indebted. Let's see what the learned author committee has to say about that. And I'm reading from page 328 and 329 of his book. And this is what the learned author says. Where the claim is for debting, i.e. wrongful detention of the plaintiff's goods, and the defendant does not enter appearance, the plaintiff may apply for judgments that the defendant delivered the goods to the plaintiff or paid their value as assessed by the court plus costs. 
Such government offers an option to retain the goods or pay the value and keep them. A defendant who is a plaintiff who insists that the goods must be retained, i.e., does not want the defendant to have the option to pay and keep them, may apply for final judgment for the for their return plus cost of the action. Such judgment operates as a mandatory injunction and compels the defendant to return the goods. A plaintiff who does not want the goods back, example, where the defendant has used and maintained it badly may apply for interlocutory judgment for the value of the goods to be assessed by the courts plus court of the action. So, take note of this. If it is a liquidated demand, we know you go for final judgment. If it's unliquidated, you know you go for interlocutory judgment. But if it's a claim in debt in you, there are specific remedies you can go for. If it's a claim in debt in you, specific remedies you can go for. You are going for one delivery of the goods to or their value to be assessed and costs. Or for the delivery of the goods and costs, or for the value of the goods and costs. Now take a look at the C very well. It says you can apply for value of the goods to be assessed and costs. It means that if you are going for this one, the kind of judgment you get cannot be final judgment. It has to be interlocutory judgment because the value has to be assessed. So if you look at what Kwame Tete said over here, that a plaintiff who does not want the goods back, example, the defendant who has used the, who had used and maintained it badly, that plaintiff may apply for interlocutory judgment for the value of the goods. So when you apply for the interlocutory judgment, then the court will adjourn the matter for evidence to be given so that we can see the value of the goods. That is when they will now give you the final judgment for the value. But if you want the value of the goods, we can't give you final judgment because we have to take evidence or attain it. So we'll first give you interlocutory judgment for the value of the goods. We'll adjourn, we'll take evidence. They will now give you the final judgment for the value of the goods as cause of the action. So for that you, please remember on a table three, if a defendant defaults an entry appearance, there are some particular remedies you can get when there's a default in entry appearance, and then on a table three, you must know all of them. I'm still reading from what committed that says. Where the court enters interlocutory judgment as above, like I've told you, if you want the value of the goods, and it's that you, what you get to be interlocutory judgment. So come let us say that where the court entered interlocutory judgment as above, it may fix a date for the assessment of damages or the value of the goods detained and direct that the defendant be notified to attend the assessment. A defendant so notified may attend and be heard on the assessment. And you can see this one too under order 10 to 3 sub rule 2 where we are told that where the plaintiff enters interlocutory judgment for damages under Rule 2, the court shall fix the date on which the damages or value shall be assessed and directs that notice of it shall be given to the defendant against whom the judgment has been entered. So we look at liquidated demand, we look at unliquidated demand, we are coming to claim for possession of immoral property. If your claim against the defendant is for possession of immoral property and the defendant defaults in mention appearance, what are the kind of remedies that, as plaintiff, you can apply for? Or the rule four, sub rule one has the answer and it reads in this wise. Why the plaintiff's claim against the defendant is for possession of immoral property only and the defendant fails to file appearance, the plaintiff may after the time limited for appearance, apply for judgment for the possession of the immoral property. Again, you apply for judgment for possession of the immoral property and costs as against the defendant. So if your claim against a defendant is for possession of immoral property and the defendant fails to enter appearance, you can actually apply for judgment for the possession of the immoral property. 
that is what you have under other 10 rule 4. What if there are missed claims? What if you have a claim where relief A, plaintiff assumes relief A is a liquidated demand, relief B is unliquidated demand, relief C is getting relief for for possession? It is simple. You can apply for judgment for each of them based on what the rules entitle you to apply for. So for relief A, you apply for final judgments because it's liquidated. Relief B, if it's unliquidated, you go for interlocutory judgments and you go on like that. So you see, on the rule five, say that you can apply for judgments against the defendants in respect of any such claim as the plaintiff would be entitled to apply for under those rules, if that were the only claim that were made. So if the relief A is liquidated, relief B is unliquidated, relief C is this, apply for the individual judgments that you can get, assuming that were the only one that you are going for. So if it's liquidated, you go for the final, unliquidated, you go for the interlocutory, and it goes like that. We only dealt with liquidated claim, unliquidated, getting new possession of involved property. What if it's a matter which has not been provided for under that thing? For example, declaration of title. It doesn't fall under any of the headings under that thing. You have not been told what we can do in terms of applying for judgment in default of appearance. Nothing is there about declaration of title to land. So what do we do? Under 10 rule 6 says that where the plaintiff's claim, where the plaintiff makes a claim of a description not mentioned in rules one to four against the defendant, and the defendant fails to file appearance, the plaintiff may, after the time limited for appearance, and upon filing an affidavit proving due service of the writs, proceed with the action as if the defendant has filed an appearance. If you make a claim and it doesn't fall under rule one to four, let's say declaration of title, please, the rules that have shown the court that you have filed, you have served the writ on the defendant, and then proceed with the action as if the defendant had filed appearance. So if your claim is for declaration of title, proceed as if you have filed appearance. Wait for the time to file defense. If that one expires, then you proceed, set down the action for trial, then go and give evidence. So let it go as if they had entered appearance. That is what the rule is saying. If it's a claim that doesn't fall under rules one to four, that is the consequence of what you must do. What if your claim is a money lenders action? The simple thing I will tell you about money lenders action and also mortgage action is that if you look at the 10 rule nine, sub rule one, or the 10 rule nine, sub rule two, and if you look at the 59 rule four, you must read these ones. If you look at the 10 rule 9, or the 10 rule 9, and also on the 59 rule 4, you will see that in the money lenders action, no court will grant you judgment in default of appearance unless you seek the leave of the court. So in the money lenders action, watch out. Look at other 10 rule 9. Look at other 59 rule 4. In the money lenders action, no court will grant you judgment in default of appearance or in defense unless you seek the leave of the courts. Same applies to mortgages actions. Look at order 10 rule 10 and also order 59 rule 5. Order 10 rule 10 and order 59 rule 5. In the mortgage action as well, judgment will not be granted unless you seek the leave of the court. So read these provisions and you'll see what kind of judgment you can apply for in default of appearance. By way of recap, what we can say is that when a writ is held on the defendant, the defendant has eight days to enter appearance. If the defendant defaults an initial appearance, as plaintiff, you can apply for default judgments. Now, the default judgment you apply for, the kind of judgment you get depends on the nature of your claim. If your claim is a liquidated claim under the 10 rule 1, you can apply for final judgments. If it's unliquidated, as we've seen under the 10 rule 2, you can apply for interlocutory judgments. If a claim is for debting you, you can go for either the A, B, or the C. The A is that you can apply for delivery of the goods or their value to be assessed and costs. Or you can apply for delivery of the goods alone and costs. Or you can apply for the value of the goods to be assessed and costs. That is for 
get to you. What if your claim is for possession of evil property and the defendant defaults an ancient appearance? The rule says that if it's for possession, you can apply for possession of that immovable property. Then what if it's a matter that has not been specifically provided for under order 10 rule 1 to 4? The rule says that you shall proceed as if the defendant had filed an appearance. What if it's a mortgage action, is a money lenders action? I have referred you to order 10 rule 9 for money lenders and order 59 rule 4 for money lenders. The combined effect is that you can only go for those judgments with leave of the courts. Finally, for mortgage actions, order 10 will 10, and also order 59 will 5. You can only go for judgments in default of appearance with leave of the courts. This is where we shall end our lectures on judgment in default of appearance. And our next letter shall relate to pleadings. Thank you.